Friends, today we, we jump into uh, our week two teaching on the, on the book of Ephesians. And as we get going with this, it's going to be awesome. Um, we're, we're reading Ephesians 1, 3, chapter 1, verse 3 to 14. And as we do that, we find that Paul is very eager to reveal something true of who the church is in this, in this scripture. He really points it out and he does it emphatically. In the ancient text, there's no grammatical expression in these 11 verses. It would be, to an English professor, a hideously long run-on sentence, but to you and I, it's a beautiful run-on sentence that tells us a lot of who we are in Christ. Here's my ask. If you, uh, in your small groups, could find one person in the room who has a Bible, or you have a Bible app on your phone, if you could open it to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, and then read that with your, with your small group, and after you read that, you're going to hit play again, and we'll do a quick sermon recap. So what this text really does is it tells us three major things about the church that we are, okay? So we're going to talk about those things really briefly. The church is first and foremost blessed, and we are blessed because we are chosen by God. And in being chosen by God before the dawn of time, it means that God knows everything about you that is wrong and that is broken and needs to be fixed, yet he still chose you. We are chosen of God. We are also adopted, which means God has conferred to us the rights and inheritance and the, and the, the impact of the family name Christian to us. We are part of the family. So we are blessed because we are chosen and we are blessed because we're adopted into the family of God. We are not like a slave who works hard for God and when we lose our usefulness, he throws us away. No, he chose us in spite of ourselves. He redeemed what was broken in us. I love this. We bear his image and he sought us out from the very beginning. That is what he did in choosing us. And we are brought into the family, given the rights of the family. The next thing we know is that we are in Christ. So the first thing is we are blessed. Okay, we are, the church is blessed by Christ, but we are also in Christ. We are tucked into the wounds of Christ so that when God looks on us, he actually sees his son in whom we've been tucked into. We are to him the very reflection of Jesus Christ, which is a beautiful thing because our fatal flaw, the thing that needed to be repaired, we couldn't fix, but Christ did in his life, death, and resurrection. So recognizing that, our fatal flaw needs fixing, and it's redeemed in Christ. But not only are we redeemed, we're forgiven. And that forgiveness is an amazing thing, because forgiveness removes guilt from us. We are no longer guilty of those sons, of those sons, of those sins. Sorry about that. Um, we, are, we are no longer guilty. We don't bear that guilt. We're not held to the past we're called into his future, which is a critical thing for the church to understand that the church in Christ is redeemed and forgiven in Christ. It's a, it's a vital point for the church. The next thing we know is that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The church is uh, the church building is not the house of God. So let me let me just say we're in the back room of the Foundry Church. We put signs on it and stuff, and we think this is the Foundry Church. That's not true. This is where the Foundry Church meets. You and I are the foundry church. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in the church and we are that church. The church isn't a building. God lives in his believers, the ones who follow Christ. And it's interesting, those of us who are in Christ also understand that Christ's spirit is in us. There's this kind of beautiful partnership in it that um, maybe we miss sometimes. So, being filled with the Holy Spirit means that you are filled or marked with the Holy Spirit. There's a mark of you, a mark on you of the Holy Spirit that says you are forgiven and redeemed and filled with the Holy Spirit, marked, a visible reality to your life being different because you're in Christ. But there's also a deposit of the promise. Your eternal life not only is for after you die, but it begins right here and now. You have eternal life in Christ. And the, and the deposit on that starts right now by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Finally, um, 
for you and I, I think the question comes back um, in this teaching of, do we realize we're chosen? Do we realize that God selected us from the beginning of time? Warts and all, he loves us. Do we realize that? And if we do realize that, how do we live under such grace? There's a conclusion, and I want to take a minute and just read it. It says this, you are part of the body of Christ. You are in Christ, and because of that, you are forgiven and redeemed forever. Christ is also in you, and through that, your life has great purpose, but you must be able to see it. We'll talk about how you see it and how you engage it next week. Friends, thank you for taking a moment and watching this sermon recap. So we want to ask some questions here, and here's what I would like to offer um, leaders, um, leaders of the, of the small group or the, the starter group or the home group. I want to invite you to be inquisitive. Uh, don't be looking to hear the right answer. Be looking to maybe ask a good follow-up question. Um, maybe keep the conversation going. These questions are intended to spur you into a deeper conversation about God. So don't feel like you have to say that was right or wrong. Just feel like you can keep the conversation going. If you have a good follow-up question or if their, their answer leaves you wondering, feel free to ask and keep the conversation relatable and going. Question one, Genesis 1.27 says this, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. They were created. The question for you is, why is it important to know that God created humanity in his, in his image? Question two is pretty easy, um, but uh, it's easy to ask. Let me say it that way. It's not easy to answer. What do you think it means to be created in the image of God? What does it mean to be in the image of God? Have you ever thought about that? I bet there could be some great discussion around your, your table or, or your living room right now on that question. All right, this next question is a little bit longer and there's a good piece of scripture with it. Um, so, so bear with me and, and listen close. Have you ever thought before about the fact that you were chosen in Christ before the beginning and that God always had a plan? Or did you think Jesus was an afterthought after things had gone wrong? There's a lot to chew on there. Have you ever thought about the fact that you were chosen in Christ before the very beginning? before the fall, before sin, and that God always had a plan? Or did you think Jesus was an afterthought after things had gone wrong? Think about that for a second and maybe let this run through your mind. God is omniscient. He knows everything and always has. He does not need to learn or find out anything. It is hard for us to conceive of this, but Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says it this way. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts higher than yours. Talk about that question we just asked. Think about the culture of Ephesus. Remember I said it was a slave culture? There would have been these ships that come into port and without power to engines to run the ship. They would have rowed the ships into port and gotten them by command to the rowers to get the ship alongside the quay wall, the docking wall. Um, imagine with me in the Ephesus climate and not climate, but culture, what would it mean to be adopted? What would it mean for a slave, someone bound to their own, you know, like life as a slave they were owned. What would it mean for them to be adopted and what would that make them? How would that change their life for a slave to become a son or a daughter? All right, the next question. Do you think Paul's teaching the gospel, when Paul was teaching the gospel, that 
in Ephesus, it would have been shocking or countercultural. Do you think what Paul taught would have been this shocking, like, whoa, countercultural movement? And if so, why? Do me a favor. Open up that Bible passage again and take a look and see who in your group can count fastest how many times Paul says in Christ in one, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. See how many times it's there. And then maybe take a minute and ask a question. What is Paul trying to say? What does Paul mean when he says in Christ so many times? And why is he driving that theme home? Do your best with your group. I would love for everyone to take a shot at this. Explain forgiveness. Can you explain forgiveness? What does forgiveness mean? I don't want to say there's no wrong answers because there's always a wrong answer. But I will tell you this. We all forgive in different ways and it would be neat to kind of hear from you. What is forgiveness? This is a little bit bigger question. I want to read it so I make sure I don't miss any of it. The city of Ephesus was steeped in pagan witchcraft practices. They were sexually broken and lost beyond what we could imagine. Most people, especially children, women, and slaves, had no value. They were, then they were introduced to Jesus Christ. And those people realized that they had sinned and that Paul taught of forgiveness and redemption in Christ. How do you think people who had no value in the world before felt when they realized this good news of how much they were loved, that they were chosen, forgiven, redeemed, and adopted. How do you think they felt? How do we respond to the good news today? In our modern context, what's the response to the gospel? How do we respond today to the same good news that Paul taught back in Ephesus? In this passage, the Holy Spirit is called a guarantee. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee of something. Here's a good question for you. What are some of the things that the Holy Spirit does in the life of a Christian. Remember, share these things and then listen. You may hear something really interesting and brand new that is true of scripture and true of God if you listen close to the answer people give on the Holy Spirit. Enough like talking about the Holy Spirit out there and, and what, what he does. What has the Holy Spirit done in you? How has the Holy Spirit been at work in your life?